Good day, this is Jim Vitell from Columbia Gorge Community College, Renewable Energy Technology Program. This is RIT 120 Hydraulics. Today we're going to have a lecture entitled Filtration, Contamination, and Fluid Maintenance. This is kind of a grab bag lecture that may actually be, be dealing with topics that you may be familiar with from your previous mechanical course. However, we are going to go into it with a hydraulics perspective. So, uh, first off, uh, here's a kind of a list of all the things we want to go over today. Um, basically, we're going to talk about fluid, contaminants, filters, and our reservoirs, and each one of these little things associated with it. Um, we are going to go back to each one of these things as they relate to each other also. But uh, one of the first things I want to discuss is what is the purpose of fluid in a hydraulic uh, system? Quite obviously, the number one, it's the stuff that makes it happen. Basically, it's the stuff that's transmitting the power, okay? So that's pretty obvious. But there's some other um, purposes for fluid inside a hydraulic system besides just transmitting our hydraulic power. Um, believe it or not, that fluid is there to dissipate heat, basically, as these... Um, components are working, uh, they're heating up, it is, as fluid flows through the, through these actuators, um, what it's going to do, it's actually going to go ahead and carry some of that heat away from there and hopefully prevent damage. And we're going to learn about uh, why heat is a bad thing uh, for hydraulic fluid. So basically, it's carrying heat away from our actuators, and it's allowing to dissipate in our reservoir, which we're going to go over in a little bit too. The third thing, what does fluid do? Quite obviously, it lu lubricates it. As I said earlier, why do we use oil in our hydraulic fluid systems, hydraulic power systems? Well, because it's oil. Um, it has got this neat, innate ability to stick to things, stick to the thin coating uh, forms on metallic substances, and they just slide across each other. Because we've got our spools sliding around in our directional control valves, we've got our pistons sliding around in our cil cylinder actuators, uh, we need to be able to lubricate these metallic surfaces. Otherwise, they would just gouge into each other and not move. Okay. Um, fourth and final function is to seal. Again, we're working at high pressures, and what happens is, is uh, that lubricating film, again, let's draw the piston inside the barrel of a cylinder. Basically, here's this pressurized flow going to tank. And again, there's that thin layer of film between here. And if we've got the proper viscosity and we've got the proper clearances between there, we should be sealing as well as lubricating from one side to the other. Okay, so we're going to go back to uh, ISO cleanliness standards when we deal with fluid. But uh, one of the uh, things we want to discuss next is our contaminants. A contaminant is basically anything unwanted inside a hydraulic fluid system. Um, when I say unwanted, a contaminant can really take the form of hydraulic fluid. You know, perhaps a damaged hydraulic uh, fluid, a damaged molecule that's been somehow acidified or something. We'll discuss uh, what happens when the uh, hydraulic oil uh, is damaged. So a contaminant is, again, something unwanted within a system. And that could be dust, sawdust, uh, metal shavings, lizards, true story, lizards, um, insects, rodents, anything. Something that we do not want in a system. And again, why don't we want it in a system? Well, think about our spools that are sliding back and forth inside our directional control valves. We are depending upon this ceiling between here and here on that side. Again, it's requiring that thin layer of relubricating and sealing film there. So uh, what would happen if some contaminants, let's zoom in on the zone here, entered that space? Well, let's say if it's a large particle, it could theoretically jam in place, and our spool would not be able to slide back and forth, which is a problem. Um, 
Now let's add a diff different problem. Let's add small particles that can fit back in that space. And you might think that that's not a problem. Well, truth be told, it is a problem because what are those little particles acting at in high pressure? Well, they're acting like a sand blaster and gouging out that section there. That's called abrasion. So braiding the, uh, the clearances there and you could potentially develop leaks through here, okay? Um, the uh, Where do these contaminants come from? Well, basically they come from daily operation of the system. Uh, just like you could go ahead and live the healthiest lifestyle you possibly could live, drinking just spring water and organic microgreens, you're still gonna die in the end, okay? And a hydraulic system, as clean as you try to keep it and you're running it at the proper um, proper recommended flow rates and pressure, just by you operating that thing is going to generate contaminants. Where do they come from? Well, it could be, you know, possibly these seals that are degrading, you know, these, uh, these rubberized plasticized seals uh, have a bit potential to degrade over time and usage. So again, they're, especially in those dynamic seals, they're braiding on the sides of the, uh, the pistons and the barrels. Okay, um, what about heat? Again, too, that's one thing too, is, is what about that heat? You know, oil as it heats up, you know, I'm just gonna do a, a simple, without going too crazy into chemistry. Here's a triglyceride uh, with a kind of a glycerin background bone, and these are our three fatty acids that are hanging off this glycerin background. One of those things that happens with this, um, this is actually more of a biodiesel uh, reaction, but um, you could potentially split those things right there. Um, the same thing could, uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is basically you could generate a fatty acid and the same thing goes with a petroleum-based oil. Um, I'll come back into that, into RIT-223, so don't worry so much about that right now. But long story short, as you heat up an oil, you can potentially damage this molecular structure and this has a tendency to become acidic. And sometimes that changes the very nature of it, uh, its viscosity, and again, its, uh, its pH rating. So it kind of can coagulate and form kind of this brown sludgy coating that sticks things together. And that's what's known as a varnish. And so some of you guys, as you pulled apart some of those actuators and pumps in uh, one of those labs, um, you probably noticed there's discolored sections on there. That's probably a varnish. And again, that's an unwanted occurrence there. That's a, a sign of uh, some uh, hydraulic fluid breakdown. Okay, um, so we talked about kind of the daily operation. It's just, that's that's gonna generate particles. Uh, daily operation, um, you know, think about a heavy earth mover that's got the rod extending out of this and dirt is falling onto the rod. Let's say your rod wiper does not clean off all that dirt. It's now in your system, okay? And acting as potential abrasion agents or if it's large enough, sticking in there. Again, it's not just gonna stick in there. Not only is it gonna stick in there, it's then gonna break apart and abrade it. So you get a double whammy sometimes with larger particles. Okay, so um, be aware that new components too, as new out of the box as they are, they may introduce contaminants, especially, especially, especially the new manifolds. Think about that. It's drilled aluminum and those metal shavings are inside there. So clean those things out. Uh, so new components there, sometimes they're shipped from the manufacturer with a light coating of machine oil. Um, how long has that light coating of machine oil been there? I don't know, but it could have been had dust settled on it. How long has it been in your shop for a while? So it's a good idea to, when you get a new component, clean it off before you install it. Um, so we already talked about uh, breakdown. Uh, break in versus breakdown. Break in versus breakdown. So you go ahead and purchase a brand new car and right out of the lot, you don't just go 90 miles an hour with it for 90 days. So there is a break 
in period where the ever so slight tolerance uh, need to be adjusted for. Um, you know, you're going to go ahead and run your system a little bit more sparingly. And additionally, you're probably going to take that system down for maintenance far earlier than you would normally. Okay, an example again is probably our wind turbines. Let's say you go ahead and purchase a wind turbine on day zero. Uh, day zero, you go ahead and get it running. And at day 10, you take it down for a monthly maintenance, maybe even a, you know, some basically what I'm trying to say is, is a maintenance far in excess of its normal operation of 10 days, because those first 10 days are critical days for it to operate. So you go ahead and make sure, hey, was this thing put together correctly, number one. And number two, that might be the, the first 10 days might be the most heavy generation of metal metal particles, say, for example, in your gearbox or anything, because of the manufacturer's tolerances are being worn down at that point. Okay, so the break-in period is an especially dirty period of time, and you need to go ahead and take that thing down for maintenance far sooner than you would normally. So you go ahead and do your 10-day maintenance, then you do weekly maintenance every week. Then you do a monthly maintenance after a month, and then you do your quarterly maintenance. So what I'm saying is break-in comes in early uh, break in maintenance. Okay, I um, already kind of went into the heat exchanger. So uh, this is going back to our fluid breakdown because of heat. So again, our heat exchanger, we've already went into the schematics. Fluid's coming in, heat is being pulled out of it. That is a cooler. Let's say this is a liquid means of cooling, okay, versus and air means of cooling, okay? So an, you know which manufacturer I'm talking about that does this. You know, that's, that's for their gearbox too, by the way. Actually, one manufacturer does use their cooler hydraulic fluid this way. Um, as the wind blows through, it's cooling off. That right there, that unit on the back there, that is an air medium cooler, okay? Um, Think about the old Volkswagen uh, Bugs. Um, they're an air-cooled engine. They don't exactly work the best, the most efficiently on a hot day. So again, air-cooled heat exchangers have a tendency to work better when there's a large temperature, excuse me, temperature differential between the fluid and the air. Okay. One last thing about the heat exchanger I need to say is, example is our tube and shell heat exchanger. Hot fluid comes in, ideally cold fluid should come out. How is, let's say our liquid cools? Again, we are going opposite directions, opposite directions. Because again, at this point right there, warm fluid is still warmer than this fluid coming in. Excuse me, let's, let's put it this way. Okay. Hot fluid, hot hydraulic fluid, is still warmer than the warm cooling fluid going out. So there can exist an exchange of heat the whole length of the heat exchanger. Do not run them so they are running together in the same direction. Okay. Um, please revisit the, uh, the lecture where I go over the heat exchanger if you need to go into that in details. But again, they run in opposite directions. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and, uh, so we talked about uh, generally what contaminants are and what they do and where they come from, but let's just talk about sizing too. So regardless of what they are, whether they're a piece of bug's wing or uh, sawdust, they are sized according to a micron. So a micron, luckily enough, you guys are wizards at this by now, that's a micrometer, okay? So let's put this in perspective. One inch, oops, so one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. That's not an SI unit, 
25.44 millimeters is. So now let's do our next step down according to uh, the SI system. 25440 micrometers. So this is an idea of how small a micron is. One inch is 25,440 microns or micrometers as the case may be. This is kind of a short slang version of it. Okay, so if that means one inch is 25,440 microns, you realize a micron is way small. Okay, um, a grain of salt, a single grain of salt, and imagine how, how hard that is to see. That's roughly 100 microns in width. Uh, human hair, like 70 microns. You know, believe it or not, these are these are sizes that you need to take into account for in a uh, hydraulic system, protecting your hydraulic systems from that. Okay, so we're going to go ahead. How do you protect hydraulic systems from contaminants of this? And that's namely through filtration. Okay, so filtration. Um, went ahead, cleaned up our little workspace here, and we're just going to talk about filters. So filters should be a relatively familiar topic for everyone. Um, just think of a mesh screen. You're filtering out mosquitoes from coming to get you. Um, you know, basically it's a porous element through which there are holes of a certain size that permit the passage of particles smaller than the hole but exclude particles bigger than. So this guy can go through. This guy cannot. It is stopped by the filter. Okay? So um, let's talk about that. How do you determine, uh, excuse me, how do you rate a uh, filter? Well, it's by two ways. It's the nominal and absolute size. So nominal, just think is an average. It will, on average, stop a particle of so many microns, microns, nominal. So it's quasi equivalent to, on average, it will stop a particle of so many microns versus absolute. So absolute, it will absolutely stop a particle of such and such a size. Now, keep in mind, I'm just talking about size. And again, the size is in microns micrometers. Um, never talked about shape, because think about an arrow. If someone just chucks it an arrow at you sideways, chances are your body's going to filter it out, and it's just going to bounce off of you. Whereas someone chucks an arrow at you going this way, chances are it is going to go through you, okay? So uh, your body will have not stopped that arrow because of its shape. Okay, so this is pretty neat here. You know, think about a particle, like a hair or something like that. Um, you know, it's got a small cross-section this direction, but pretty long this way. It depends on how it hits the filter. Okay, so what the absolute is rated as is the spherical particle. Spherical particle, hard spherical particle. So let's say this has a this filter has an absolute rating of 100 microns. It means it will stop 100 micron hard sphere. Uh, absolutely. Totally, I guarantee it. Whereas its nominal range, you know, it might be, it could nominally exclude 60 microns, you know, because sometimes there are bizarre shaped things. And again, too hard. It's not like it can deform or anything like that. So um, we already talked about nominal absolute. Uh, beta ratio. Beta ratio is the measure of a filter's effectiveness. And the way to think about beta ratio is, here is some dirty hydraulic fluid. We pass it through our filter, and it comes out the other side. What you do, you shrink a dude really tiny, and he counts all the particles. 
in here. And that dude goes over the other th thing and counts all the particles in there. And the ratio between bad and good, you know, that's the beta ratio. Okay? So you think basically, um, you know, if it's if there's a hundred particles here of a certain size at let's say a hundred five micron particles, and there's twenty five micron particles because it's again it's by size for a particular filter, and then let's say that's filter model A, filter model B let's say has 50 5 micron particles on the good side. So which is more effective? Pretty obviously, filter A. That's because its beta ratio is higher. So what it is, it's upstream, downstream. So 120 has a beta ratio of 5. Whereas filter B, upstream, to downstream, 100 to 50, its beta ratio is 2. Okay? So it's just a measure of a filter's effectiveness. Let's say you've got some dirty fluid. You might say, okay, it's time for us to switch to a more effective and more money filter because we need to make sure that the good side is as good as possible. Okay? And it's it really is not a dude that you shrink down. Don't don't even apply for that job. It's just a, a means of uh, counting particles. Okay. Um, so let's talk about our, our uh, filters here. Uh, you got bad fluid here. Why not just start with better fluid? So that's we're going to come back to uh, the better fluid when we talk about our ISO numbers here. Okay. Um, and you want to talk about money upgrading to a higher ISO standard of cleanliness for uh, hydraulic fluid to begin with. That's some money. We'll, we'll come back and talk about that. Um, let's clean the screen up here real quick. Okay, so where do we put our filters? So we may have seen a schematic symbol like this before, where this is coming from some portion of the system through a directional control valve from our pump obviously pressure relief valve in here This is a symbol that we're pretty used to. What is this line right here? Well, that's our T line, our return line. So if this is in the return line, that is a pretty good place to put a filter. And obviously, it's known as a return line filter. Reason why is basically fluid is coming from our tank, being forced through our hydraulic system, and it's doing its work and coming back to our tank and being filtered. What's neat about that is basically it's cleaning itself up. Excuse me, the filter is cleaning up the fluid to be pumped back again. Okay, so you're starting off with clean fluid. It goes through our dirty system here. It cleans it out and sends it back because what's neat about these schematic symbols here, I know I just drew three tanks in there, one, two, three. They're all the same tank. Basically, that tank's whole job, the whole reservoir, its whole job is to clean and condition the fluid. We're, we're going to go into uh, how a reservoir cleans and conditions fluid. But the first way is, is basically filtration. You go ahead and put a filter on that return line, and all fluid that goes through your hydraulic system is going to be filtered and the pump is just going to pick it up and send it pick up clean fluid and send it back through the system so that's a really neat way of doing that and 
uh, someone may ask, well, why don't we just start with clean fluid to begin with? Well, the deal is, it's basically a return line filter. It's not operating at any special pressure requirements. If you really do want to go ahead and protect your pump, there is something called a suction line filter. And a suction line filter is like that. You just put that return line filter and you place that in the inlet of the pump. Why is it different? Well, because that is a vacuum right there. Because how is it going to, remember, just go back and revisit the, uh, the pump lectures there, basically by creating an expanding space. There's a low pressure requirement and fluid is drawn into the chamber of a pump. So that pump is operating at a vacuum condition. So you may have to get a special type of suction filtration filter. Okay? So that's the fourth type of uh, filtration, for, excuse me, fourth type of location. And additionally, there's another type of location and type of filtration. And that is what's known as a pressure filtration. So basically, excuse me, a pressure or an inline filtration. So let's say this is a super valuable cylinder with incredibly high tolerances, excuse me, incredibly low tolerances. It requires very small spaces and you have to make sure that, let's say you borrow this thing. You're, uh, you're borrowing it from your buddy. You want to make sure you don't break it. So what you're going to do is you can actually put a pressure filter here or pressure filter here assuming this is coming from the pump. Now, the question is obviously is, which one's a pressure filter? Well, they're both pressure filters, but there are special requirements for these two particular filters. Again, a pressure filter is operating at pressure. Let's say our pressure relief valve is set to 600 PSI. Now, there's 600 PSI there. You're not going to take a return line filter that operates at low pressure and just stick it in there and hope that things are good. Um, let's consider the two locations. And again, if, let's say if we're in the straight through position, this is also 600 PSI right here. So these two filters don't look exceedingly different right here, these two pressure uh, inline filters. But think about the flow direction. This guy is unidirectional, constantly receiving flow from its inlet to its outlet. And this guy is a bidirectional filter. And it, while it should definitely be a bidirectional filter, if you put a unidirectional filter in there, things would be bad. Because now think about this, in the straight through position, inlet, outlet, cross connect, inlet, outlet goes that way okay so you may need a bi-directional filter so be aware that there is a unidirectional and a bi-directional pressure filter so now think of a unidirectional filter here is our filter and here's dirty fluid coming in and all these particles are sticking to the outside because they can't pass through these tiny porous structures. And what's coming out is this very clean hydraulic fluid. Okay? Now you go ahead and switch the direction, the flow direction. Bad things happen. Pressurized flow enters here and pushes these particles that have been trapped and taken out of circulation back into the fluid. So don't do it. Use a bi-directional filter if you are putting it on the other side of the directional control valve. Okay? So there is a fourth type of pressure, uh, excuse me, fourth type of filtration that you may not have seen before that's becoming uh, increasingly popular with some of these hydraulic systems. It's known as a kidney loop filtration. So you may see something 
off to the side on the schematics. Little pump, little filter, back to the tank. And you might have all this gobbledygook out here for your hydraulic system with all sorts of valves and cylinders and actuators and directional control valves. What is this isolated little thing? Well, that's a kidney or offline, kidney loop or offline. Now just think, what is the purpose of the kidneys in your body? This is basically to filter your bloodstream. Um, that's what this guy's doing here. It's This thing is pumping, this thing's returning, etc., etc. There is another tiny pump in there that is going through a filter, basically taking all the impurities out of the reservoir, out of the fluid inside the reservoir, while all this gobbledygook is going on. Okay, so it's basically just a tiny little unit there that is constantly making sure the stuff inside the tank, which by the way is again that tank and that tank and that tank all throughout your hydraulic system has got the goods in it. Okay, so that's a kidney loop or an offline uh, filtration system. Okay, we talked about beta ratio bypass. Uh, we, I think I already previously met that, mentioned this and we've seen these in our labs there. As a filter comes through, taking dirty flow, it's going to clog up. So what you do is you put a uh, check valve with a little bit of pressure, excuse me, a little bit of force induced by that spring there. And basically if that pressure differential from our inlet to our outlet exceeds the pressure required to open this check valve here, basically that check valve is going to reach its cracking pressure and it's going to start to flutter. And what's going to happen on our little needle gauge is going to go from our green to our yellow. You go ahead and keep on operating that thing. It's going to go into the red region. The red region means our check valve is completely open. This filter is totally blocked. And all flow is going through this thing. Basically, it's allowing emergency operation of this thing, knowing full well that you are not filtering that fluid anymore and you could potentially be damaging your system. But again, so it's an indicator. If it's in the yellow mode, chances are you need to change it. If it's a red mode, you definitely need to change it. Okay? So filtration is just one aspect of basically fluid conditioning. Um, the major thing that is doing some fluid conditioning seems like such a passive clunky little component a clunky big component for that matter but it, it plays an incredibly important role in a, any hydraulic system and that is the reservoir okay the reservoir's purpose is again is basically it stores fluid what's it doing while it's storing the fluid well it's making sure you've got an adequate supply but it's allowing that cool that fluid a chance to rest Basically, it's cooling itself off, allowing the time for contaminants to settle out, allowing for entrained air to go ahead and work itself out of the system. Okay, so let's take a look at what's inside a reservoir. Okay, so some of you guys may have seen this when we took apart our uh, uh, hydraulic power unit and you popped this thing apart and you saw some things inside this box. So. Let's draw our box, our reservoir. And let's start off with a poor design. Here's our pump sucking in. Here's our tank coming back right next to it. Probably a bad idea because that's hot, hot fluid that has got probably some dissolved air inside it. Probably a better idea. Put your return over here. Okay, and it's again going through its filter there. Um, another good idea. Well, great idea. Make sure it's up to a certain level. Why not put a wall in between here and there? It's not a wall that it can't possibly surmount if the fluid level is correct. But what it is, it's a means of separating That just returned fluid, well actually let me draw it correctly in orientation, that 
just return fluid from the fluid that we want to pick up. What it is, fluid level is filled up here. This baffle is providing a means of temporary separation. You know, so basically, hot, airy fluid with a bunch of contaminants in it can't just get sucked right up in the first place. You want to give it a chance to go ahead and cool down. How do you do it? Throw a couple of obstacles in its way. First off, you get a baffle. So now all this fluid that's coming in here, that's got these contaminants in it, is not getting sucked right up, and those contaminants settle out to the bottom. What's cool is, is why not put a drain plug right there with a little magnet on it that is attracting all those metal filings. And if you got metal filings in there, you pull out a drain plug one of these days and you see a bunch of metal filings, there's a problem with your hydraulic system. You know, some component is getting abraded, okay? Um, so what's the purpose of the drain plug? Obviously to drain that out. On the side of these things, you might see a larger cover. Do you, that is not the drain plug. That is not the drain plug. The drain plug is this tiny little guy. The big one, that is a clean out cover. Drain it out first, then pop out the clean out cover to clean out everything inside, okay? Including all those settled contaminants, okay? Um, the magnet just makes it a little bit easier pulling things out of the system. So we talked about our baffle, we talked about our cleanup cover, we talked about a drain plug. How do we know what the correct level is? Chances are it's got a sight gauge on it to see what the level is. Additionally, you might have a model with a little thermometer built into it showing you the temperature of your return fluid inside the reservoir. So there's this thing here is a breather. This schematic symbol means that it's an atmospheric reservoir, i.e. atmospheric pressures coming on to this fluid and that, because there is a little bit of a vacuum here, is what's forcing the fluid into the pump. Okay, let's modify the schematic ever so slightly. That's a pressurized reservoir, okay? So meaning that there is pressure inside there that is forcing fluid into our pump, okay? So how do, we don't just have the top off this thing in a dirty environment. You know, we don't just have it sitting there, especially like a sawmill or something like that. You gotta go ahead and find a means to cover it. That's what's known as a breather. Um, a breather is also sometimes quite often formed in the uh, formed right into the filler cap. So we go ahead and take a look at what the reservoir may look like externally. Here's our drain plug, here's our clean out cover. There's our little top to it. Here's our sight gauge. And here's all the gobbledygook that we've been talking about for an entire quarter attached to it. Um, that's where you go ahead and fill up the oil should levels get too low. Additionally, it also serves as a way of allowing atmospheric air to enter. Thing is, you don't want everything in there. So what a breather does, it's like an air filter, okay? It's just making sure all that sawdust and mosquitoes and cigarette butts are not getting into our reservoir, but still staying at atmospheric pressure, okay? So the other thing is you notice you go ahead and screw this thing unscrew this thing off right here. What do you see inside there? Well, chances are you see like this little mesh depression, like this dish. I'm trying to draw this correctly. What is that? Well, it's this little strainer, you know, because chances are the first thing when you unscrew that thing, you're looking down in there, what falls in your wedding ring that mosquito go right into the reservoir. All that sawdust that's been piling up on top of this thing, you pull that breather filler cap off to fill it up and all this stuff gets immediately attracted into there. Um, 
all you do is just pick that stuff out. So basically this strainer, and that's exactly what it is. It's a strainer. It's just a giant filter, making sure all that coarse object stuff is not going to get lost inside there. And the, what's cool thing about a strainer, they're reusable. Just pull it out, tap it on the ground, your wedding ring will come out, and all those things that you lost inside there are going to come out. Whereas a filter, it is not reusable. Once a filter has got all that stuff stuck in it, it is not reused. It needs to be tossed or disposed of according to the company policies. One second. Okay, so one of the other things too that's super important about um, these strainers and the breather and filler caps, let's say you do work in a sawmill, you know, clean all that stuff off the top of the reservoir. Uh, provide some form of tenting or, or, or means of cleanly accessing this thing, okay? So the breather filler cap is super important to make sure that uh, objects are not falling inside there. So again, going back to our strainer, it's a coarse filter that is reusable. Um, you may see at the inlet of a pump, you may also see a strainer there. And that's a really good idea. So just kind of a last lines of a defense. It's not so much a suction filter because it is just a, a coarse wire mesh um, before things get sucked into the pump. Okay. So that is pretty much it for our reservoir. Oh, a uh, mesh count. Uh, mesh count, again, like a, just think of a, Here's, let's say, 50 ups and downs, 50 lefts and rights. It's a mesh count 50, whereas a mesh count 100, 100 left and right, 100 up and down, okay? So a mesh count 100, it's a smaller holes. It's going to filter out smaller substances for uh, strainers, okay? Um, again, reservoirs as clunky uh, as they may seem, very incredibly important components to any hydraulic system. Okay, uh, last but not least, let's go into ISO cleanliness standards. So you go ahead and buy a hydraulic fluid off the shelf, and you have three numbers on it. And what those three numbers represent, it's a code. Um, I'm going to clean this up here. And what those codes represent is 2, 5, and 15 micron particles in a milliliter of a particular hydraulic fluid. Okay? So these are bins, by the way. So if I say to you, 19. 17, 14, I don't mean that tiny dude shrunk himself down and counted 19 2 micron particles, 17 5 micron particles, and 14 15 micron particles in a milliliter fluid. What those represent are number or bins. The number 19, I don't expect you to to, uh, to memorize the, the tables or anything like that. The number 19 represents 2,500 to 5,000 two micron particles in that particular uh, fluid. And the number 17 is 640 to 1,300 five micron particles in that particular milliliter fluid. The number 14 means 80 to 160 15 micron particles in that particular milliliter fluid. Okay, so if I was to say uh, I want a cleaner fluid, I'm going to move to a 16, 14, 11 fluid, meaning that now I've got 320 to 640 two micron particles in that particular milliliter fluid. So these numbers don't change here. It's always 2, 5, and 15. These will change depending upon the quality of the fluid. Again, higher quality, more money. 
Okay. Uh, what if someone says to you, hey, give me a 1714 hydraulic fluid? What they're saying is, I don't care about the number of two micron particles because they're so small, they're not going to affect my fluid. So if someone says to you, gives you a two number ISO code for hydraulic fluid cleanliness, they are talking about the five and 15 micron particles and they don't care about the two micron particles. Okay, I think that's pretty much it for this lecture here, uh, discussing filtration, contamination, and fluid maintenance. Uh, you should at least be able to describe some of these concepts in general terms. Um, you should be able to calculate beta ratio for a filter if I gave you upstream and downstream counts, and you should be able to pick out uh, filters in a schematic and tell me whether they're suction pressure return or an offline kidney loop filter. You should be also be able to name the components and purposes of the devices that are found inside a reservoir. Um, also finally what is uh, what is the purpose of uh, fluid conditioning is basically what is the purpose of fluid is going to transmit power, it's going to dissipate heat, it's going to lubricate and seal our hydraulic system. Okay we're going to move on to electrical control of hydraulic systems.